Hey guys, before we start, a quick shout out to Alpha Dog Nutrition for sponsoring this podcast. Alpha Dog products are now available at dusupply.com and you can use code ALPHADOG15 at checkout for 15% off and a credit for free shipping to try it yourself. Now let's get you to your podcast. Fielder. He's gone to the dogs. Hey, welcome once again to the Gone to the Dogs podcast. This is Steve Fielder, your host, coming at you here from the sauna in the great state of Florida on the West Coast, about 20 miles north of Tampa. And you could very uh, intelligently ask, what in the heck is a coon hunter doing down there? Well, I tell you, at this time of year, he's you got to figure he's lost his mind, <laughs> number one. But uh, this is where I live, and uh, everybody's got to be someplace, right? <laughs> Somebody told me one time, said, no matter where you go, there you are. So this is where I am. And, uh, man, I'm going to uh, introduce you to uh, – fellow that I haven't known very long, but I, I've al- always enjoyed talking with younger people. Uh, as you know, I'm a little long in the tooth uh, myself, but um, it's so refreshing to get the perspective of young people, people especially that are interested in our sport. And we hear so much nowadays about, you know, is the sport dying? Is it you know, uh, are the young people interested? Are they not interested anymore? So we've got a guy today that uh, is not only um, interested in coon hunting, he's interested in making coon hunting uh, better, making it great again, as we may have heard Absolutely. someplace. But um, welcome to the Gone to the Dogs microphone, Caden Riley from Ball Ground, Georgia. How you doing, Caden? I'm doing good, man. It's we're about the same state you are. It's uh it's pretty brutal up here. Coon hunters up here this time of year about about shut it down. It's about 95, 96 degrees in the middle of the day. Oh so it's- man. I spent a little bit of time in Georgia in the summertime coming through there mainly on my way uh from my home in West Virginia down to Lakeland, Florida, where I was going to college. Georgia, I believe, I know Georgia's hotter than Florida. Uh, I think we have these sea breezes that blow across the peninsula here. And I'm on the West Coast, only a couple miles from the Gulf right now as I speak. And uh, But uh, it's hot, don't get me wrong. It's plenty hot. It's humid and all the above. But, man, especially southeast Georgia, man, that was an oven. But you're up in the northwest part, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, we're a yeah. little more uh, northwest. Down in the southeast uh, region, you got guys like Lennis, Ty Flanders, uh, a couple other guys. I don't know how they how they bear it in the summertime because I know it's brutal on us, so it's got to be twice yeah. as brutal on guys like that. Well, I know. Uh, I think they just had a hunt here a couple weeks ago in Hazelhurst. And I've hunted out of Hazelhurst in June. I think they had some legacy hunts, PKC events up there. Uh, And, uh, you know, the the marsh ants up there, uh, uh, Jarvis and and Matt and uh, some of those people there have been longtime PKC people. But, um, well, listen, Caden, uh, what's it like around there where you live? Is it hilly, flat? What you got? Oh, it's oh, it's hilly. We're yep. blessed that uh, our spot's pretty flat for the most part. I mean, you can get in some hills, but we've got more of the flatter land around us. But there's some spots mm-hmm. that are that can get pretty mm-hmm. hilly and pretty rough. But uh, we're just kind of accustomed to it. It's always funny whenever we go up to Illinois or something like that. People start talking about these rolling hills, and for us, it's like <laughs> it's paradise for us whenever we go up there. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I. Hats off to the hunters of the South. You know, I Absolutely. <clears throat> I first learned to, to do a little coon hunting, as I said, uh, well, in the South, when I was in college in Lakeland, Florida in the 60s. 
And, uh, you know, I learned all about the snakes and the gators and, and the skeeters that can carry you away and all of that stuff that really makes it a challenge, especially in summertime, to hunt in Florida. Uh, I don't recommend it. I mean, wintertime, it can be beautiful. It can, when uh, the guys are fighting uh, free, deep freeze and snow and ice, you know, we've got some pretty good weather down here. But uh, so you got some kind of, you're in the hill country. How far are you from Rome, Georgia? About an hour from Rome, Georgia. I go over there okay. and a pretty good bit. We're about 55 minutes, an hour away. It's not I too gotcha. bad. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, a uh, lot of coon hunters in Georgia. Got a, a good friend over us. How are there? Yeah. A ton. Well, how's the coon population over there? You're doing good if you're hunting, you know, let's say you hunt a 90 minute pro classic. I'd say on average, we're going to tree two to three. If well, you that's get a, pretty good. Yeah. 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 If you, if you can tree two singles in a hunt, you're going to win a lot more mm -hmm. and you're going to lose. We don't have a bunch of coons. We got a few, but yeah. Few and yeah. far between. Well, you know, I've noticed watching the videos and reading the re results of some of the major events, the big PKC events and the, the pro sport events and so forth, the scores, you know, one or two coons are usually all that's required to win a cast, especially yeah. two coons. You're looking pretty good, you know. And, of course, the dogs are, are uh, scattered out there to themselves a lot more than back in the day when I started, when I was involved in competition hunting. Uh, the most, you know, the dogs were pack animals. You know, you, we, we had most trees. We had a, a saying, you know, get, uh, get some of every tree and then get one by yourself. And that was a winning combination. Yeah, yeah. But now that that whole, whole picture's changed. Yeah. Times have definitely, definitely changed. And I'm, you actually spend more time walking than you do really anything else exactly. in these songs. Just four dogs, everybody's leash locked. It's just a very different era. Well, I want to ask you straight up, man, you can, you can, uh, answer this or not answer it <clears throat> okay but shoot. does it bug you when old guys like me talk about the good old days talk about the days when we had big hunts talk about the dogs back then and all does, is that irritating or is well, that interesting i'll tell you uh, it, straight it, up straight it, up man it's a little bit of, it bugs me and it's interesting it bugs me because i wish that I wish that I got to hunt in that era whenever hunting was big, big. Like both of my brothers, both my older brothers hunted whenever they were my age. And they talked about how whenever you go to school, you know, everybody has a dog box. You know, whenever I roll into school, I'm the only one. People look at me and like, what's that? You know, so I'm, it's a different, it's definitely a different era that I'm in. And I really enjoy, you know, hunting with, you know, what I'm given, but a part of me, you know, wishes I could have been around whenever it was a lot more of a mainstream type of, type of event. I got you. Well, times change, everything changes. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate. Well, it, you know, I started at the bottom of the totem pole and then I was able to be involved in the sport, <clears throat> very closely involved with it at its height you know, and then I saw, you know, the peaks and the valleys and, and ultimately, you know, we went through uh, a turn for the last few years where circumstances out of our control, you know, got involved. Uh, I'm sure you probably got some issues with deer leases and yes. things like that, where Absolutely. you live, uh, places to hunt, number one problem you know, urban sprawl, which contributes to that, the cities growing, spreading out, taking over the hunting territory. And then <clears throat> the fact that most kids, I, I ask you, were you raised in the country or in town? I mean, uh, was your... I would say I was, I wasn't like raised in the city, but I wasn't raised far out in the country. I was kind of in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. I was close to, okay. you know, pretty close to cities, 10, 15 minutes out, but far enough so where we could still, you know, have our yeah. privacy and still feel yeah. like we were in the country. Yeah. 
Well, back in the early days of coon hunting, when people took the magazines, that was the only source of information. <clears throat> uh, you know, most people were in a rural setting, you know, farm kids, uh, you know, and, and I heard so many stories of guys saying, you know, I could have my, my folks drive me so-and-so miles and drop me off and I could hunt all the way back home and nobody cared that I, you know, whether I had permission or not. They really didn't care that I hunted on their property. Well, as you know, it's not like that anymore. But uh, so that all those things contributed to the decline in uh, in the number of coon hunters. And a big one was fur prices because a lot of coon hunters all across the United States uh, hunted for the fur and because they could make a decent uh, contribution to the Christmas shopping list every year, you know, with a, w when they sold their furs. And I enjoyed that too. When I lived in Michigan, I, I wouldn't ever consider myself a, a fur hunter really, but I did when the season was in, I harvested the coons and we, we uh, skinned them out. And uh, I chose just to freeze them and take them and thaw them out and take them to the buyer. Some guys put them on the wire stretchers and stretched them and, and fleshed them out and all. And they got a couple dollars more for their furs that way than I did. But fur harvesting was a big part of coon hunting uh, back in the day. And so all in the decline in all of those things, you know, led to the eventual decline of the number of coon hunters that we see at the events or we see at the coon clubs. Do you have a local club there where you uh, live? We actually, for not having a bunch of hunters, we have a ton of clubs. We've got, I mean, mm. I've got probably seven, eight clubs within an hour of me I could go to. There's yeah. Dawsonville. There's our club at Rydal. There's Talking Rock, Rome, Shannon, Ella J, Chatsworth, and there's a couple others yeah. that I know I'm missing. Gillsville is not too far. So we've got a bunch of clubs. And like you were mm -hmm. talking about with the, the spots declining, I'd say that's the main the main issue we face is you have people who used to own these spots and then they start dying out or they start selling it to their kids or whoever. And the kids aren't mm -hmm. as keen on letting their you know dad's mm -hmm. buddy come over there and hunt and shoot coons yeah. or whatever. So whenever we try to put these big hunts on, that's our main that's our main stressor is do we have the spots and we've got to get, if we want to put a big hunt on, we got to have everybody on board and have everybody's mm -hmm. spot to use. If we want to have a big hunt for, you know, have 32 dogs or however we want to do, that's about our max down here. That's if everybody is on board and ready to roll. Mm. Well, that's it. You know, guides are everything, you know, you don't have a place to turn those dogs loose, whether it's an hour a 90 minute hunt or two hour hunt, whatever, you got to have a place to run those dogs for, you know, that length of time and, you know, in a safe place, a place you're not going to get run out or arrested, <laughs> a place where the dogs aren't going to get killed on the interstate highway. And all those things figure in and the guide becomes such a vital part of the equation, you know, and, uh, People don't understand the evolution of of coon hunting, I don't think, because a lot of people, you still see some old-timers like me, say, oh, hunting and non-hunting judges, every cast ought to have a non-hunting judge. Uh, you know, the problem with coon hunting is, is hunting uh, judges and voting and all that. You need, yeah, if you had a warm body, that was a qualified, physically fit individual to go out and judge a cast and perhaps guide that cast for two hours. And every club had an ample supply of those and places for those guys to go. Yeah, that's the best of all worlds. It's Absolutely. not reality. <laughs> it's so. fascinating. You kind of see slowly but surely over time – at least from the time I started, it kind of slowly wither away. You had the two-hour cast, 
they kind of get taken down to 90 cast, you know, just for earlies. And then they start doing 90 cast for late. And then they just do 90 cast or 90 minute cast across the board. Cause they just don't have the spots for that. And then you start having, you know, non hunting judges pretty much everywhere whenever I started. And now it's, you have hunting judges in the semifinals of a major event. Yeah. And it's just yeah. slowly, but surely over time you see the evolution and the change and not necessarily a good change, but it's just kind of what we're, got to play with the cards we're dealt well absolutely and we and it doesn't do any good to belabor the point that back in the day you know and but but when you're old like me the memories are about all you got left and it and and, you know the memories are stored translate to stories and all go ahead it's very interesting whenever i hear somebody that's been around it a lot longer than i do talk about you know why they started you know you talk about fur trading and stuff like that that was just I was, I've never even, you know, heard of that for somebody around m- right. around my age or something like that. So, but now yeah. it's like the purpose of it. It's not even to pleasure hunt for enjoyment anymore. For a lot of people, it's can I have a dog that I can train to go win big money? And that's yeah. been a change in coon hunting: is big money, big yeah. money, big money. How can you win the most money in the least amount of times? So that's why you see the state race kind of start dying out. And getting mm. substituted with these pro classics and with these, you know, you can go to a hunt when 40 grand in a night. And it's just crazy yeah, it's how unreal. we've seen it is so much money unreal. get pumped into this. Yeah, I, I have friends that have earned, you know, have won $100,000 hunt. Yeah. You know, <laughs> a hundred grand hunting, you know, that was just. Uh, you know you would uh well i'm so old we didn't even we didn't even have a drug problem in society when i was young i started to say you'd say that guy's on drugs if he told you he won a hundred thousand dollars but we didn't even have that Hmm. but you know yeah there has been quite an evolution and and we could talk an hour about that you know about the things that that I've seen, you know, I was there when we went from a three hour hunt to a two hour hunt. You know, I was there when I had to change the, the format for the UKC world hunt to a zone system because we had so many dogs hunting on Wednesday night. We had our entire entry hunting on Wednesday night and get this, not on, not with just one, non-hunting judge but each cast had two non-hunting judges and to put that in the woods on a wednesday night when the guys had to get up and go to work the next day you know we had dogs that weren't even getting turned loose for the first time until two o'clock in the morning you know so it was crazy and we realized that they had to make some changes so i was there through all that you know and it's, it's very yeah. interesting whenever a lot of these you know a lot of these people that have been around the sport for such a long time talk about stuff like a three-hour cast about you know 40 50 people showing up for a little club hunt because i've never seen any of that i've never i never got to see the three-hour cast i never got to see the crazy turnout of the club hunt if you show up to a club and there's six dogs you're like holy cow we've got a we've got a serious turnout tonight yeah whereas back then it, that was get it on. You know, nothing it's just a totally different environment and totally different sport yeah. really well sure and then you know i was there uh, when we decided to do double headers you know yeah. and um, uh, that was to help the clubs and to give the guys an, an additional opportunity to get another cast win. I was there when we decided to change the system to cast wins only. You know, we had dogs that were required to have a first place overall for the whole hunt to be a night champion. And and we had dogs that we had called, uh, had the second hand, our second place blues. You know, they'd have a dozen or more second place wins, but could never get the first. So all these things evolved out of, you know, uh, well, necessity. The idea of the two-hour hunt came about because of guides, because of uh, availability of hunting territory. You know, one of the most famous coon hunters in the history of our sport is John Wick, who lived in Missouri and, and started Wick Outdoor Works, and quite an innovator and all. 
when we decided to go to the two-hour hunt, he said, what? If you're a coon hunter, you ought to want to hunt four hours instead of three, you know. But the idea, uh, you know, most of the hunters didn't realize that those guides were the thing. that yeah, made, now, it's you know, a, made... now a two-hour hunt takes people like us aback for a different reason. I mean, you, I mean, the chance to hunt a two-hour hunt once a year. I mean, most every pro classic's yeah. about ninety minutes. Every big mm-hmm. hunt you go to is about ninety minutes. Yeah. And whenever you hear two hours, whereas you know, however many years ago, it's like, well, that's nothing. Now it's like, that's a totally different ball game. It's like feeling like you're hunting all night whenever you get yeah. used to hunting <clears throat> sixty minutes or ninety minutes. Well, and when I look back, and I'm sure some of my contemporaries would would feel the same way. You know, we would say, "Why did we do that?" Why did we put ourselves through three, three hours? You, know, you could go out and get a pretty decent score, maybe three, a couple of coons, but keeping that score for three Absolutely. hours was tough. Man. Yeah, you know? a lot of casts now with the shortened cast, I've been on more casts decided in the first five minutes than not. Dog trees, coon out of the mm. truck, 100 and 100, mm. get out of the country. That kind, especially down by us and thinner coons, wins. So that's yeah. another interesting thing is the constant evolution of what are you looking for in a dog? Are you looking for yeah. a dog that it's going to get peace out of the truck? Are you looking for a dog that's going to be off to themselves all the time? Do you want a more silent dog that's going to treat two to their one? Or do you want a dog that has to get their mouth open, tree one, and then hopefully stay out of trouble and hold on? Well, that's the ongoing conversation, you know, and those, again, you know, in, of my age group and younger, of course, I'm on the upper end of the scale of the spectrum. <clears throat> but, you know, there's a lot of talk that old things will eventually come back around full circle. They'll circle back, as Uncle Joe says, you know, to um, uh, because of the lack of territory because of the of, of the inability to hunt four dogs that want to go each go a mile their own way yeah. and and you know i'll be honest i hunted you know i lived in michigan for 22 years had wonderful coon hunting i could not have hunted the dogs that were hunting today on the spots that i had there i mean i couldn't have i would have been Dogs have been crossing highways. They'd be yeah, because it used to just be you know, drop tree coon. Everybody gets a piece of it. Then you pick up, move, or whatever, and you have people coming in with you know twelve hundred plus because exactly. you're making you know drop it tree coon move. And it's a totally different environment oh, now. Oh yeah, or it's, people don't want theirs to get a piece out of the truck for a while. It started looping back to that. I've seen a little bit with the shortened time mm-hmm. of the hunts. You need every plus point you can possibly get. If you yep. have a chance to tree for a quarter out of the truck, you better get that quarter and then you better tree your own. Cause if you go two coons down, especially where I live, yeah. unless you have a serious coon dog, you might as well withdraw. Cause it's no, it just that's, rarely happens. that's, that's a hole that's going to be hard to climb out of. That's for sure. And, you know, having the videos and all and hats off to people like Clayton Stark and, and Josh Michaelis and, and the, the boys at, at pro sport, Greg they Maynard, do a great those job. guys. Yeah. They bring this stuff into our homes, you know, and we can sit there and we can look and we can see the picture of, you know, the night I watched the Lone Pine lady, you know, when that, Joy Super Hunt, you know, three three singles, you know, just absolute. Every time me, John Strickland flipped her loose, you know, she was in the dark. You may not hear from her for a while, but you know, those dogs. The one thing that's happened, for sure, in my view, is the dogs have become more accurate, because yes. we went through a pe- a time with the dogs, and especially in the popular Walker breed that there was a lot of slick trend going on, you know, and there was criticisms toward PKC because in PKC you could win without actually seeing a coon. You know, you could win on circle points or on minus points on a bad night. Always maintained that, you know, a plus tree, a coon in the tree is going to beat all the circle points and all the minus points in the world, you know, but still, uh, that all, you know, that has all changed. And uh, the dogs, I believe, are more accurate. 
Uh, we can beat that horse to death too, but I believe they are I think not. A, as, a reason for a lot of that is with when you see dogs getting more independent. And 90 minute cast, there's a real chance that you're only going to have time to walk to one of your dog's trees. You can't just waste the tree because you may have four dogs all treed, everybody's leash locked. This is the hunt. And if you don't have a coon right there, there is no second chance. There is no, you know, I can get another oh, yeah. piece. We have another drop. You know, it's, mm-hmm. That's it. You got to make every second, every plus point, every tree count with the shortened hunt times. So there's a lot less margin for error. Yeah, the nemesis of the coon hunter is that den tree, you know, because now Absolutely. with the, the thermal imaging scopes and all that, we can basically, if they've got the coon, we can find it. Uh, unless it's in a hollow, you know, we may have yeah. heat around the hole, but we got to see it. And uh, well, it has changed tremendously, but it's like everything else. When I was a kid, Caden, I didn't have a, a screen that I could carry around with me and bring the world right into my my little world instantly. You know, I can get anything I want on that screen, you know, and we didn't have anything like that at all. So things were so much more fundamental, just basic. And, and back in that day, and you alluded to this earlier, and I thought that was good, talking about, you know, what guys know about their dogs nowadays and all. You know, back then we studied dogs. We listened to dogs. We learned every grunt, squeal, and wheeze that that dog had, you know. And because we spent time, we were concentrating on the dog. Most guys nowadays are concentrating on the screen when they're Absolutely. out there on the hunt, you know, and Absolutely. so the whole sport has changed. Uh, and you'll see guys that like, like your Michael Wards and your Dustin Weed, you know, some of the top tier handlers, sure. they'll go to the super stakes and hunt four different dogs and four different nights and get all of them in. Cause yeah. with higher technology and stuff like that, you can get a dog and you can just kind of figure it out on the fly. Oh uh, yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd i like to stay positive, and I'd like to look at, uh, I believe, in positive reinforcement more than negative. Yeah. But back, you know, the the uh, Elite Handler series that Kane Stream, Stream Media and Joy is doing, you know, to me that's a misnomer because the guys really aren't that much of – they don't handle the dog anymore. And I know a lot of them are going to say, Fielder, what do you know? You never won 100 grand. Well, that is absolutely true. Same here. But I know that when all I got to do is I flip that dog out in the dark and I know he's going to go three quarters to a mile. And if I can hear him, I'm going to ask the judge if he can hear him. If the judge says, yeah, I got him, then I've got, everybody else is the other four, three points of the compass. And I can say, sit there and scratch my head and decide what I need on this tree. And, you know, what are the odds? Uh, Do I even need to tree this dog or whatever? I've got all this time to decide what to do. Back in the day, back in the treeing contest day, you had to come off that tailgate with the hammer back, you know, cocked and ready because like you say, you get down a coon right off the bat. Mm, It's going to be tough to catch up. It's a totally different kind of, for me at least, what do I think of when I think of an elite handler? Because I've been on cast with guys that have won a crazy amount of money and they are very good handlers. Like they know their dog and they know all oh, yeah. that, but a lot yeah. of it's Yeah. Just, I don't mean to totally diss these. No, guys. no, no. I'm, I'm not I, trying to do that I, at I all don't. either. And, no. but what I think of is it's not actually their handler ability because dogs kind of with dogs being more independent, it takes a lot of the handler work out of it because it takes a lot of the calling contest and all that stuff. You rarely see a calling contest anymore. No, it's from my no. vantage point, but what those handlers, what makes them so good is the six nights a week they've hunted all night in preparation for that big hunt. That's what I think of when I think of an elite handler is somebody who's put in the work to train that dog to be a finely tuned machine. And it's just yeah. it's every time, every yeah. time, extremely consistent. You look at dogs like Wipeout Z and some of these other dogs. I mean, every hunt they go to, 
they're getting in big money because those mm-hmm. guys are exceptional dog men and they make they have found a way to get them to do what they want 24 7 for the most part yeah. so that's where i think they deserve a lot of their the praise that they get is because they've put in the work to make their dog you know exactly how they like them and it's just well, you gotta, no doubt you gotta respect that absolutely oh absolutely you do and uh <clears throat> yeah it's um <clears throat> It's a, a beautiful thing to see, you know, these dogs that, these elite dogs <clears throat> that just like you, the Z dog you mentioned and others, um, that what the competition hound has become. <clears throat> the very first days, and I'm getting a tick in my throat here. Excuse me. You're all right. But back in the day, when the very first set of sets of night hunt rules were, or actually the first events right after World War II, we had, you had subjective judging out there, a judge out there judging the dog that he liked the best, the one he liked the mouth the best, the one he thought was the coldest nosed, the one, you know, that. Yeah. He felt drifted a track better than the other. One that suited and him. The one that suited him precisely. And, uh, you know, that all has, has evolved, uh, you know, to the dogs of today are just, uh, you know, it doesn't take as many tools, though, to make, I mean, no, let me back that up. <clears throat> That's not the word I want to use. It doesn't take as many features today for someone to recognize a dog as being a coon dog as it did back in the old days. <clears throat> the dog had to have <clears throat> the big mouth. He had to have, you know, the cold nose. He had to have a lot of things. Today, the dog basically needs to go hunting and find a coon and have a strong enough mouth that the judge can hear it and stay there until you get there. And those yeah. are the basic features that a dog has to have to them. And a lot of these ambush dogs, they've been kind of trained to just hunt as fast as they can. And they're not looking for a coon track. They're looking for a coon. So it's just a totally different type of dog that you would categorize as a coon dog now to you know, 50 years ago and people will disagree and agree on, you know, what's better. And I think that's the fun part of this sport is the sports definitely changed. Some, I think for the negative, some, I think for the positive, but on a positive, I mean, like we were talking about with the screens, you can look at your phone and know the result of every hunt in real time. You don't have yeah. to wait for a magazine. And that's one oh, of the yeah. ultimate evolutions of, of the sport. And old and guys. Just, yeah. Go ahead. And you get a lot more of an insight to what the dog's doing. I mean, you can see how many miles an hour they're going. You can see how many barks a minute they are. You can see actually the path that they're taking. So you can see actually what your dog is doing like you're there. So there's been yeah. a lot of great improvements for as much as we could reminisce that we wish some things were different. And I know I wish some things were different. There's a lot of things that I'm very grateful for and that keep the sport alive and keep the sport exciting for somebody like me. Well, yeah, and especially, and I don't know if we mentioned this earlier on, and I think my listeners will be a, a bit amazed when I tell them this, if I haven't already, you're 19 years old. Yes, sir. You know, and, and very, very much in tune with our sport. <clears throat> How did you get started coon hunting? Well, I started when I was probably six or seven, just walking with my dad on cast because my dad coon hunted and both my older brothers coon hunted. So I kind of was blessed enough to grow up around the sport and grow up around the sport and grow up around dogs and stuff like that. So I was always kind of just around it and knew about it. Then over time, I just walk with my dad a little more, a little more and start knowing you know, what you need to do to win a cast, etc. And then when I was about 11, 12 years old is when I'd start, you know, dabbling a little bit of the competitions. And that's when I really got hooked and got the adrenaline of, you know, 
it's me and my dog against these other three guys and their dog. And that's, that's something I really, really enjoy. It's just the feeling of are me and my dog better than these guys and their dog. So it was, I was very blessed that I got to do this with my dad and do this with my brothers from a, from a very young age. And for as young as I am, I feel like I've been around it for, you know, just as long as everybody else. Well, it certainly shows. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm like you. I learned the sport from my dad. Uh, my brother was younger, <clears throat> so he came along later, eight years after me. Uh, and, of course, I we hunted together some, but we had vastly different interests, you know, at the, back when we were kids. But my dad, you know, was a consummate coon hunter. I mean, he a tree dog man and a bear hunter. <clears throat> So, you know, I just, um, I was his shadow and that's how, you know, I developed the love for the sport. And, uh, well, what kind of da- uh, dogs did your dad hunt? He's, he's gone through about every type of dog through the years. By the time I started hunting, it was consistently walkers, but he talks about how, you know, they used to have some really good plot dogs, some really good blue tick dogs. And it's, fascinating to hear him talk about what was the popular breed at a certain point because now i mean 90 percent of the dogs are are walker dogs i mean you see the occasional blue tick or something like that but whenever my brothers were my age they hunted consistently blue dogs and that was the most popular breed in a lot of places at that time so so it was very fascinating to hear about you know at this point in time, plots may have been the dominant breed, and then red bones may have been the dominant mm-hmm. breed, and blue ticks may have been the dominant breed. Because I've only ever seen Walker, 95% of dogs, and you may see an occasional blue tick and an occasional red bone. Because I love red bones because the movie Where the Red Fern Grows. Oh, of course. <laughs> and I've, I get excited every time I draw with one, even if I'd never heard of the dog before. Everybody the loves a red bone. Everybody Absolutely. that read Wilson Rawls, Where the Red Fern Grows, loves a red bow. And I was fortunate in my part of the country in West Virginia to hunt with some guys that had some really good red dogs. Uh, they made a point to go out and buy good dogs from Missouri and different places, you know, and, and bring them in. And, uh, yeah, so I hunted with a lot of red bows when I was younger. Um, of course, my dad being a plot man, you know, that's what I hunted pr- predominantly. Uh, what were your, uh, what are your brother's names, Caden? Uh, my oldest brother, I got to make sure I get their age right. Cause they're both a lot older than me. They're both about okay. 20 years older than me. So they were I in see. a totally different era of cooning than I was. Oh, I got you. But if I'm not mistaken, Justin is the oldest. Okay. And then Ricky is the person okay. who I'm a little bit closer in age it, with, but they're both pretty good bit older than Is I your dad still living? He is. He is. He still haunts with me you know, oh, three, good. four nights a and week. And what's his name? Uh, Rick. 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 Rick Riley. Okay. That's yes. good. And I was that blessed awesome. with I was blessed with a great dad who not only cared enough to get me involved, but cared enough to eventually let me take the reins as the main handler and he'd buy mm-hmm. dogs that I wanted as opposed to what he wanted. And that's a, I don't think Man. I realized till I got a little older, just how selfless he's been and helping me grow up with this sport and learn to love this sport. So, and a lot of people don't get that opportunity to have a dad that wants them to have the opportunities and not himself. Mm-hmm. So I'm incredibly blessed to be able to, I heard a very good yeah, I heard a very good sermon for Father's Day yesterday, and uh, talking about things like that, you know, how dads need to be engaged with their kids, but they also need to to respect those kids' wishes and the things that they want to do and get involved with them and find out what they like to do and all, you know, and not just do as I say. You know, um, so yes, indeed, you were fortunate, and and I was too. I had that same type of dad, and unfortunately, a lot of kids don't. And um, what I would like to see, and then we're going to get around to uh, the main reason that uh, you're on the podcast today, and that's to talk about this project that you have there with the youth in Georgia. But uh, 
you know, I, I am just so, um, I don't know the word to use really. I, I am excited for the future of the sport. I'm also concerned for the future of the sport. I don't believe it's dying. I believe there's enough young people, certainly maybe not at the level that you have attained in your short life, but there's certainly a lot of young guys out there that are enjoying coon hunting, and I hope that they're enjoying it for the right way. I don't want the kids out there to just be like the kids growing up in the inner city saying, I'm going to play for the NBA. You know, therefore, I'm not going to go to school. I'm not going to worry about school. I'm not going to worry about my books. I'm not going to do anything. I'll just get to the playground, shoot hoops, learn to dunk the ball, you know, and which is a total, you know, pipe dream because very, very few of those kids ever do get to professional level. Yeah, I mean, there's, what, 300 NBA players in the world. There's however <laughs> yeah. many. NFL players in the world and the chances that you're one of them, it's great to dream, but yeah. you gotta, you gotta stay grounded in life. Yeah. And that good was to reach for the stars. Exactly. And I've said this before and it's, it, it's old news to my listeners, but when I spoke to the PKC youth at their uh, were, uh, national championship or world championship, I said, you know, all you guys out there are a lot of you want to be professional coon hunters. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that as a as a desire, but realistically, very, very, very few people make it to the status of being able to coon hunt for their living. Uh, I mean, so there's maybe get, yeah five or ten that I can think of because the same people in the big time winter circle tend to be the same people in the big time winter circle. You yeah. They're not, it, weed, that's not growing in. by leaps no. and bounds, is it? No. I mean, you may occasionally have a new guy that pops in, but for the most part, yeah. it's the same core group of guys. Exactly. And, and, you know, and as I said, you know, get that learner trade or get that education. Then you get a good job, save your money. You can buy a new truck. You can buy a new fancy dog box. You can buy three or four hundred dollar light yeah. and I'll, then and like most of us have all that gear and have a two dollar dog to handle yeah. holler at. <laughs> but anyway then you can do anything you want pretty much Absolutely. in the sport you can enter the big hunts if you want and i'll kind of segue it back to kind of my upbringing with my dad especially and mom as well because she was never you know, she wasn't out in the woods with me, but she was always very supportive of what I was doing and made sure that my clothes were washed and ready to roll by the time I got home and immediately go off to hunt. But they were always, we will let you hunt as much as you hunt, but you better have your grades, you know, reasonable. And I don't, you know, want you getting in trouble for doing dumb stuff out of school. You know, I'm, I was just like every other high school, high schooler, you know, I did a couple things, you know, that was ridiculous in hindsight, but this sport kept me out of a lot of trouble that I could have fallen into if I wasn't doing this. And they would always say, you know, if you lose, shake the guy's hand. If you win, shake the guy's hand, be a classy winner and a respectful loser. So it was, I got afforded the opportunity to do what I love, but there was, I had to take care of business first and I had to make sure my grades were good and that I'm going to college now and all that. Good stuff. for you. Good for you. Caden, well, that's it. And, you know, parenting pays. Good Absolutely. parenting pays big dividends. And I have several friends. I, I I talk about him all the time. I know people probably get tired of it, but my friend Randy Smith, the Lone Pine guy up yes, in Pennsylvania, his Smith. his boys are doing very well in life. And and um, you know, it's uh, it, it's very very important. Well, your kudos to your parents. They've done a an awesome job. Now, well, an outstanding, an outstanding duo of parents. I could not be more blessed to have them as my mom and dad. Absolutely. Yeah, well, well, good for you, brother. Okay. <clears throat> the reason you and I got together is I believe that I maybe first heard from you talking about this 
youth series that you have going on yes, there in the state of Georgia. And, you know, before I mess it all up, I, I just want you to tell the listeners, you know, what it is, um, how you, you know, have come to this point with this thing, um, uh, Anything, you know, that you can share with the listeners about this, uh, certainly the why, you know, why did you want to get involved in, in something like this and um, how it's going and, and what your goals are and so forth. Just kind of fill us in. This is called the Peach. Give me the, the full, full the name. Peach State Shootout. Peach State Shootout Youth Series. All right. And it is through PKC, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, PKC All sanctioned. Right. Yes, sir. Right. And you, uh, as I understand it, contacted or or became acquainted with Chris, the director of the PKC Youth Program. I did. Uh, how do you pronounce his last name? Uh, Freiberger, if I'm not mistaken, I'm Freiberger. probably wrong on that, but I'm yeah, somewhere he's in one of those I, he's one of those Iowa farmers. I think he's probably got a good German name there. Yeah, I'm sure it has a little more, a little less country than how I'm pronouncing it. Yeah, yeah. But well, I'm in the ballpark. well, what is yeah, what is it, and what uh, and what's going on with it? Just fill us in. Well, I'll start with kind of pitching the idea of I was just, I think I was hunting one night. Because we had my nephew with me. He's only four or five years old. He's just now starting. And I was thinking, I really, I guess my whole purpose in hunting can be boiled down to, I don't want to be the last generation that does it. I want this around for him whenever he gets my age. I want this around for my future kids whenever they get old enough to start doing this. So I started thinking about some stuff that we could do. And I was like, well, I'll just reach out to, the big man, Chris, because he's done an outstanding job for for the youth, and they just had their youth nationals, which is a massive success, and congratulations to all those kids. And I reached out to him, and I go, I really want to get the youth of Georgia involved, because we didn't have much youth down here, to my knowledge. And I looked on the races and standings for PKC youth. There was one person from Georgia who had won any money in the youth for this entire year so far. Hmm. I was like, that's just, it shocked me, but it didn't really. Cause I was at, cause I just got out of the youth program last year. Last year was my final year. And I think back in 2020, 2021 or something like that, I went to the uh, Georgia state youth championship. There's three dogs. Oh, that's it. Wow. And there was just, there wasn't much excitement around the youth. I was really the only one me and, uh, Justin Perryman, who lived in mm -hmm. more South Georgia, one of the all-time youth mm -hmm. leaders. It was pretty much just me and him. There weren't a lot of younger kids that were involved with it. So I reached out to Chris and I said, what do you think? You know, what do you think is most likely to – because it was a hard mission because we were trying to get a group of kids that we didn't even know existed yet excited in this thing. And he sent me a text back and he goes – well, there's been this model that they've been doing in Missouri and Illinois. I think it's still going on in Missouri. I think Illinois may have wrapped theirs up. But it was, what he pitched to me was something like six to eight doubleheader $35 hunts, and you can take the top nine, the top 12, however many you want, to a championship hunt. You can decide, do you want it based off money, based off cast wins, anything like that. But that was kind of the rough model he sent me. And I thought about it, and I was like, I really think this could – this could get some, some grassroots youth out and showing up. So I reached out to how many people here? I reached out to Curtis Todd to have right. the first one. I reached out to Nathan Tilson, to Nicholas Brown, to Brett Denny, to Lamar Pettyjohn, and to Jeff Dollar. I said, Are y'all would y'all be willing to have some of these hunts so we can try to get eight double headers? Because if we're ever gonna have youth in Georgia, this is the best way to do it. And they were all rock stars about it. They were all fully on board. They sent me dates. They sent me what would work best for them. So I reached back out to Chris and I go, we're, we're on board. We got a full team that's ready to, ready to try our best to see what we can do here. And he got the ad made same day. He was excited about it, sent me the ad, and that's what we're, we're at now. So we ended up on the format of eight doubleheader 
youth hunts, and I'm taking the top nine to a championship in Shannon, Georgia, on October 5th. So if you win, let's say, two casts and you're eighth in the standings, you'll be able to hunt in that championship hunt. So it's we're excited about it. We've had some really good turnouts. I won't lie to you, it was a little slow the first couple first couple times because like we talked about not all that long ago, it's hard to reinvent the wheel and to pitch a new idea to these people and be like, trust me, it's gonna work. You know, whenever you have these hunts that have history and legacy to them, people are much more inclined to come out. Oh yeah. So we had a little bit of a slower turnout for the first two, but in Chatsworth we had eleven dogs early. And nine dogs late. We're expecting a similar turnout this Friday at our club in Rydal. So we're we're picking up some traction, and we're and we're seeing a difference. That's the exciting thing is we're really starting to see these kids get excited for this. Awesome. Well, the Rydal hunt will take place just prior to this podcast being released. Yes, sir. Uh, yes sir. I think we'll be releasing on the twenty third, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> so the 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 listeners out there. Kids, you've got one coming up on the 29th in Shellman, right? Yes, sir. And then the twenty, and then the twelfth of July, uh, in Somerville, Georgia. The twentieth of July in Carrollton. August sixteenth in Shellman. So that'll that will conclude the series, then, right? With the Shellman. Yeah. yeah well, that right? will that will be the final date to try to get yourself in the top nine. That so we're hunt. trying to get into the top nine dogs. It says here the earnings leaders from the qualifying events will qualify for the championship. You know, one of the most important things that I did, I think, <laughs> when I was with PKC, and I was with that organization for about seven years, and and I had a lot of fun, and I was editor of Pro Hound Magazine there at at time and did a lot of things with the events and, and all, but man, when the kids came to town to Aurora, to the tennis center, back in those those days, we did the youth world and then the world hunt where uh, actually the youth world was the last two days of the world hunt. And, uh, you know, they they were all together, which I can see why they separated them and so forth. But it was such a rush for me when all those kids came to town on like Friday or maybe Thursday night, they started rolling in with their parents and their dogs and all. And PKC really did it up with a nice banquet for them at the, a local restaurant and they have a speaker and I was privileged to do that out at Salem once and I really enjoyed doing that. That's awesome. But one of the highlights I always remember of a thirty three year career in working with the registries was thinking these kids have really worked hard this year. And we know what the earnings are for every one of these kids that are here that are qualified. Let's get that list. And when they're through with their banquet and all, let's give them all a number that that they appear on that list. And tell them to line up at the back door of the tennis center with their dog. And as we're going to call those those kids in with their dogs <clears throat> right up in front of the stage on the carpet. And they're going to get to walk up there and make a circle around with their dogs. And I thought, man, we need something to, to really make this thing go. Yeah. At that time, country singer George Strait had a song out that said, dad, this might, must be the uh, best day of my life. I can't talk about this without getting teared up. We played that song, and those kids walked in with their dogs, and their names were read off. Caden Riley, the dog's name, the amount of earnings. The parents are on the front row. The, the cameras are flashing. Everybody And people are applauding. 
I said, man, I can't do anything that's more important than this. I cannot do anything in the coon hunting world that's more important than this. So anyway, without getting emotional, I I greatly applaud what you're doing, uh, and Caden. I and think that... <clears throat> I'm going to try to get through this without getting emotional as well. Back to what you were saying, there is nothing more important than the youth of our sport and trying to create something special for them. And I've yeah. been at a few of these hunts so far. I've been at two, two out of three of them. And I got to judge some casts, and I got to see the excitement on these kids' faces, win or lose. And it kind of Correct. reminded me why I do this, why I love it so much. Cause you get lost up in, well, did I win? Did I lose? And I have this amount of money won. But whenever you're out there and you're getting to see these kids compete, a lot of them for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, it's really special thing about this hunt so far is I've actually got the standings right here. If you don't mind me. Uh, oh, let's do. Absolutely. So we've had seven winners so far out of the possible nine through our three hunts. And I've actually got the stand-ins right here. First place so far is Gregory Mitchell, who doubled up last week at uh, Chatsworth. He's got 121. So he right now is in line because we've got two special trophies, one for first place in the standings and one for the winner of the championship hunt. So if it ended today, Gregory would be the winner of the standings and that trophy as well. Obviously, he'd have to keep it going throughout the eight hunts. Mm -hmm. um second is cooper fields this kid if i could stop for a minute and give this kid a special shout out he has been at every single one of these hunts and has hunted every round so far okay if if we could back up just a little bit do we have any other information about the kids like their dog's name or or uh, where they're uh, from or anything like that Gregory's over by uh, us, kind of around Rydal area. He okay. was hunting his dad's dog named Sue last oh, week. Okay. I don't know if he'll continue with that dog because they can change if they want, mm-hmm. but he'd be smart too <laughs> considering he doubled up. Sounds good. He did pretty yeah. good last week. <laughs> okay, well, go ahead. And then this young man that's been been at all of them, you say? Yes, yeah, young man named Cooper. He's been hunting a dog named Trip, and he lives a little more kind of – closer to Dawsonville type area, a little bit away from me. But this kid has been at every single hunt. He, I've seen him win with grace. I've seen him lose with grace. And if he wasn't there at those first two hunts, we wouldn't have had a hunt because we've had, we had a total of 20 entries last week when you combine early and late round, which is really good. But for the first two hunts, we had a total entry of four. Hmm. Yeah. So he was there whenever we were struggling to get this thing rolling. So he deserves a big, big shout out. And Absolutely. whoever whoever raised him did it the right way. That kid is extremely respectful, and he's really what coon hunting's all about. He's a great sportsman, and he puts in the work. So I will be, I'll be hoping to see him in the final nine. Oh I'm, yeah, I'm thinking we will. And what's his name again? Cooper Fields. Okay. Way to go, so Cooper. Got a, Great job. Yeah, we got Case Martin, another incredible young man, very respectful. And I've seen him. He doubled up at Gillsville, and he lost both last week. And I'll tell you, his demeanor did not change between last week and Gillsville. He was ex- an exceptional guy to hunt with, shook everybody's hand, and he's just he did it the right way. Yeah. And – I wish I was like him whenever I was younger, because for as much as I loved it, I was also guilty of putting a little bit too much stock in did I win or did I lose. Mm -hmm. And if I won, I had a great time. If I lost, I didn't have quite as Mm -hmm. quite a great of a time. Mm -hmm. But that kid understands that sometimes it's your night and sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lesson that a lot of us need to to take. And that doesn't matter how old you are. That never changes. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Tie for fourth and fifth. We've got Gage Baldwin and Houston Childers. I got the chance to meet both these young men. But, again, extremely respectful, extremely polite, extremely excited to have the opportunity to be in some of these hunts. Uh, Six was Kanan Hogan with $54. He got his first cast win last week. And then seventh place was Jay Saylor, who was actually our first cast winner 
of this whole thing in the early round of the what was the first I'm trying to remember the location we had here for the first time but the hunt in southeast Georgia it'll come to my head in a minute but he was our very first winner and something that's been really special about this hunt so far is all seven of these young men that was their first ever cast win and that is just yeah that makes it all worth oh, it. Oh, yeah. That first Absolutely hunt would have been in Claxton, it. I believe. Claxton, yeah. that's it. Okay. I can't remember if it's Claxton or Hazelhurst or Shelman yeah. or one of yeah, those areas. Yeah. Well, awesome, man. And it sounds like you're getting the cream of the crop there in Georgia, these youngsters. We're getting some, yeah. some incredible handlers and some incredible young men. It's It's been an honor to watch them compete so far, and I look forward to seeing them compete through the final nine. Well, that, that's awesome. Now, did you say you've selected the location for your final jet or not? I have. Okay. Shannon, Georgia it, uh, is Matt Evans Club on October 5th. That should be a Saturday. And that's going to be a really, really awesome day. We're going to have a lot of stuff planned. You actually inspired me earlier to do something. Whenever you're talking about listing each of the kids and what they had won and giving them each their chance to walk up and have their moment. I'm, I'm, we're going to do something like that. There have, yeah, yeah. you know, each kid lined up and have their moment with their dogs to get their picture took by themselves and have, I promise, have their moment that they deserve. I promise you'll get as much out of it as they do. It's just yeah. awesome to watch those kids, yeah. you know, the, it's a, it, it's a special experience and you really realize you really realize whenever you get to see that that everything else in the sport it's fun but that's the important stuff yeah. that's the stuff that lasts a lifetime is giving those kids that memory that you know they'll pass on to the next generation absolutely just, that is so important in the podcast that's running this week as you and i are recording i'm talking to fred moran a octogenarian coon hunter from Pennsylvania, 87 years old. And he wow. and I talk about that, about remembering the first trophy that we won in the night oh, hunt. Oh, yeah. You know? I, and I, I do. Remember I mine. remember it as well as if it was yesterday. I can remember when they called my name. I can remember walking my way up through all that room full of coon hunters and getting yeah. my trophy and walking back to my dad, and I'm sure I was grinning from ear to ear, and it was about 12 inches tall. I got sixth place. It was called the Southeastern Ohio Championship, and there were, believe it or not, 106 dogs that night. Wow. But I think I rubbed all the the brass off that. That Back then, they made the trophies, the figures, the treeing dog were were made of metal, cast metal, and they were gold plated or you know, looked I'm sure I rubbed part of that off on the way back home <laughs> looking at that. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you were. Uh, yeah. Well you you're doing a great, great thing, Caden. Well what about uh it's too soon to tell, but <clears throat> do you see this going forward? Do you think this has got a future for an annual thing in Georgia? Well, I've gone back and forth on it. I really hope it, it does. Um, in order for this thing to work, it's all pretty much donation-based because mm -hmm. most of the pot for PKC Youth Division goes to the Youth World or the Youth Nationals yeah. or something like mm -hmm. that. So the way we raise the money to do not only payout but to do sweatshirts and hats for each of the final nine as well as two really nice trophies and a dinner and banquet for the final nine was all raised by some very generous people and sponsors. Mm, yeah. People so have to kind step of, up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People <clears throat> have to step up. And for as much as I came up with the idea, this would not have been anything if I didn't have the help that I had. This is a mm -hmm. true, true team effort from top to bottom. Right. And it takes, it takes everybody. <clears throat> well, I, so I hope so. Mm -hmm. We'll just have to see. Well, I certainly want to commit to having you back on as this thing has, it gets down to the wire here. And we certainly want to recognize those people who, uh, unless, you know, they've asked not to be, uh, that have made this possible for you as we, as we go forward. I think it's a great thing you're doing, and uh, I, I, I really applaud it and uh, encourage really our listeners that. 
got a couple bucks you don't know what to uh, do with, just get and message me. I'll I'll get the information how you can hook up with Caden and uh, and you guys can uh, do something for the youth, not just for the youth of Georgia, but for the whole country. You know, the sport of coon hunting uh, needs to go forward. It's a good yes. thing. It's a positive thing. It's something that can change lives for kids, especially kids that are, uh, you know, in, in what is it they call it when they say kids in the inner cities or so forth are, are uh, you know, they're apt to get in trouble. There's a term yes. there, but I can't think what and it I, is. And I can promise you, if I wasn't hunting, I would have found the trouble. Oh, yeah. Because I very much a, an addictive personality, an all-in personality. I'm all into what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. And hunting allowed me to be all in on something productive. My buddy, <clears throat> Keston Jesse, who's about 10 years older than you, young man, family man, and he says the same thing, you know, that coon hunting at a young age, you know, uh, kept him, and I just can't get him in the hunt. He's got a dog that could win. Oh, my gosh, could he win. But he's just say, <laughs> I don't know why. He said, I'm just a coon hunter. I don't I don't need to do that. But, but at any rate. Sounds like I need his number because yeah, I can right. win right now. There's a lot of people could uh, use Keston's dog. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you that. Yeah. All right, Caden Riley, it's been a pleasure, man, to have you on the podcast. I apologize for the <clears throat> all the growling and coughing and all that I'm doing, but that's life for me right now. I hope it's going to get better. But uh, yeah, it will, it will. We're going to have you back as this thing progresses and, and keep the listeners abreast of what's going on. But I uh, want uh, to uh, thank you for what you're doing to promote yeah, our I sport. To, uh, to thank you for, for the opportunity to promote this thing. And it, like we talked about, it takes everybody from top to bottom. If you're listening right now, if you're an adult and you want to come and judge one of these hunts or just be a helping hand, reach out to me. We are always welcoming new people that want to help out the youth because there is nothing more important in our sport than helping out the youth and watching these kids compete. And it's a, an experience you'll never forget. Absolutely. So I strongly encourage people who want to get involved, reach out to me. I am I am not a hard person to talk to. Obviously. And we want you involved. We want everybody involved. Well, I couldn't, you couldn't have said it any better, uh, Caden. I have judged youth cast, and it is a trip. Except when you get those 16 year old kids that walk you in the ground. Uh, (laughs) We were, uh, one quick funny story. We were last week at the early round, I was judging a preteen cast. I don't think I felt any older than I did in this moment. We actually went into sudden <laughs> death because nobody had even made a tree yet. And this one boy's dog gets treated way through the country, and we're in some thick stuff. And I was so focused on getting through all the briars and stuff like that, I turned around to make sure there were you know no youth behind me struggling. I turn around, and I'm the last one. <laughs> I'm the last one <laughs> on the line. All these youth are trucking to go see what this oh, dog has. Yeah. I was like, oh, Lord, I'm I'm starting to slow down a little bit. I know that feeling. Of course, it's been a few years since I judged the youth cast, but I, uh, I remember that well. But seeing those kids compete and handle their dogs and all, and they're good. These, yeah, these kids good. are good, man. They know what they're doing, you know, and it, it's just a, a real joy. Okay, that's going to do it for this week, folks. Uh, once again, my guest is Caden Riley from Ball Ground, Georgia. Caden uh, is uh, spearheading the Georgia, the Peach State Classic? Is it shootout? Shootout, that's right. In PKC, it's got to be a classic or a shootout. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's one of the so two. We're going to tell you more about it as time goes by. Kate, and have a great week, whatever you're up to. I hope it's uh, you, you stay nice and cool there. And it's a great state of Georgia. Cool as we can. <laughs> yeah. Well, folks, uh, we're going to wrap it up for this week. And uh, this is Steve Fielder for Caden Riley uh, saying if uh, you don't have anything else to do, just go to the dogs. <laughs> All right. Good night, folks.